it's kind of starting, which is great. Um, also, uh, I mentioned uh, Srinivas Turaga. Srini uh, was my first academic uh, advisor. Actually, not my first, technically. I, I did some research in, in college as well, but as Aaron was describing, uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, worked in research in a research lab as a research assistant and software engineer in a deep learning research lab. And it was Srini who brought me on as kind of his main um, computational guru. He has been, he was working in deep learning before it was called that and actually left the field because there were no jobs in deep learning for him to do. So he did postdocs in other fields and then came back to deep learning later. Um, he's a really amazing guy. Um, also my family and friends, of course, and can't uh, go without thanking Wikipedia and Archive <laughs> as well. I mean, I, I probably learned more from Wikipedia than maybe human experience itself. And um, yeah, yeah, so thank you again. Um, so why should this talk interest you? I know you're already here, so we have kind of a selection effect where all the people who aren't interested aren't here. I wish I could talk to them as well. Uh, but um, yeah, there have been, um, there are, as I was alluding to earlier, there have been a number of uh, developments in not just deep learning as an overall field in terms of, um, uh, if there's, I mean, I'm not even going to go over the whole area because I, I couldn't even do that anyway. But specifically for running on um, uh, things as slow as your phone, there have been a lot of improvements in algorithms, um, which uh, I'll be going over. That'll be the most of the focus of my talk. Unfortunately, I, I'm actually not going to be sharing any code. This is all mainly going to be um, how things work, certain advances that have happened that enable smaller network architectures that can achieve uh, levels of performance that used to be uh, the state of the art on, on GPUs. Um, but also there have been um, some uh, phones have gotten faster, batteries have gotten better. Um, what else? I have a, actually a few things here. Um, cameras on phones are getting better. Now they're, uh, they're going to be it's, it's more common now for phones to have multiple cameras, which then enables new types of uh, depth perception in, in images uh, in a way that enables perhaps new applications of, of using a smartphone, using AI. Um, and also with, uh, as far as like new possibilities and spillovers, um, well with the possibilities, yeah, now we, we're not really enslaved to just using GPUs anymore. We can we can use these algorithms in, in our pocket. And um, in terms of uh, spillover with other industries and so on, I was thinking, um, this is, I'm wondering that I kind of want to touch on toward the end of the talk, but I think it's very important um, because it's really about application and, and why this is relevant, not just academically, though that's interesting as well, but in terms of how this can make the world a better place. So things about um, things like uh, robotics, uh, uh, Internet of Things, any sort of hardware that has sensing involved, like a Nest in, in your home, like those little uh, smart sensors, or really any, any device that people, that is marketed as smart today, I mean, with this type of stuff that it could, that could run on a simple, uh, 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 what is it called, like an integrated circuit on that device could be much smarter, like what we are calling a smart fridge today, if, it, if a fridge could use object detection internally to know exactly what groceries you have and how old they are and forecast when they're gonna go bad. I mean, that's something that fridges aren't doing today, but they probably could. And that's a, un, it's, a, a it's a market opportunity that, I don't know, some of you may wanna start a business in this and, and develop some of, these, some of these products. At least I do. This is one reason why I'm actually working in this area right now. Um, full disclosure, I'm interested in uh, starting a business using this technology, which is why I'm kind of obsessed with it recently. So, um, and a couple other ideas. Oh yeah, self-driving cars. This is uh, probably uh, the number one area that has an uh, application area that's been driving a lot of research in this area because people um, using the cloud takes too long to get feedback uh, for an autonomous vehicle. Um, one advantage of having on-device uh, algorithms is that 
you have much shorter latency. There are other advantages as well, which I'll touch on later. Um, but as far as um, applications where you need immediate feedback and need to make decisions very quickly based on information about your surroundings that you need an autonomous agent to understand, um, this, uh, the, as algorithms get smaller and can run on uh, smaller hardware, it enables things like self-driving cars that can have a, a, a small computer in them, um, or drones, or any sort of other autonomous thing, like something that is a, um, these, these are already out there, um, things that uh, clean floors, and they, they go around, uh, has anyone seen these? Roombas? Roomba, exactly, thank you. Are they using deep learning to use some sort of inference visually or probabilistically to... I'm not sure. I have one in my house. Um, yeah. I don't think so. It's, it doesn't seem to be... I don't think they are either because I don't think they have a camera built in. Yeah. Or any sort of other sensing. Maybe it has some rudimentary sensing technology. iRobot does, does do some rudimentary deep learning. They really? Learn, okay. Yes. yes. Cool. They, they learn not only your floor and, and they also learn... Uh, different time, and they have, they're working on one because iRobot, the, the CEO is a lady, and they're working on the military version of the iRobot, and it's, awesome. it's the same source code, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they're working on it. All right. And, I mean, and they basically have the CPU of a phone, yes. Okay, yeah, so that's a great example that's already in production, already uh, little mini militaries in people's homes, I guess. Is it an actual Maryland military application, or is this? They're, they're building military, they're, they're okay. building security robots. Interesting, okay, so this is, yeah, I'm sure that there are, especially in, in, in military applications where, um, you know, like with just uh, drones that are uh, in, in combat, this is already being used. I personally don't know anything about that, that's a little uh, classified. If, if I may say a comment. They're actually sure. looking at, they have a robot that looks like a garbage can that roams around places like uh, Winn-Dixie and Publix and actually their camera can detect or sense if a person is shoplifting based on by how they, they act. So the, ca the, the robot will detect whether somebody's doing something suspicious and all of a sudden turn the 360 camera and phone home and say, hey, you know, it looks something suspicious here. So. Yeah. Again, very simple CPUs because they have to be battery powered. I, I, I've heard as well that Amazon, uh, I think with the kind of Roombas or iRobot things, they must have some deep learning, machine learning going on. Because what they do is scan your home and they'll look for, okay, this is a sofa, this is a table. Oh, they're missing a chair. Can we then send them an email to get this person who owns this? Do they want right. to buy a chair? <laughs> and so they're thinking on that level of how to use those applications. Right. Yeah, that makes sense too. Anomaly detection for you should buy this thing to not be anomalous anymore or something like that. Yeah, so thanks for, by the way, for kind of chipping in. Maybe we can get some other, uh, hey Jack, see you over there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm glad that uh, there's some enthusiasm for these ideas here already, which is great. It's a little less work for me. Um, yeah, so also I just kind of, kind of wanted to touch on other technologies that have and, and where analogous technologies in the past and where I think today's technology is compared to where other technologies were in the past. So we think about the transistor, which is hugely transformative as a, as a technology. When it was first discovered, when was it? I think in the late 40s or early 50s. It was a super <laughs> crappy technology. It didn't work very well, but eventually, you know, people made it work a little better and then Transistor radios came about. Um, an interesting story about these I've heard is that um, the main technology that they eventually replaced, uh, vacuum tube technologies for amplifying a signal, all the manufacturers of vacuum tube technologies, uh, vacuum tubes rather, were not interested at all in transistors because they weren't as good as vacuum tubes for the applications that were, they were mainly used for. And of course, um, at first, you know, the transistors then uh, it, it enabled an application that wasn't possible before, like a, a pocket radio. And then gradually the technology improved over time and it kind of took over a whole, a whole new market. Similarly, I think with uh, client-side web technology, um, applications like, uh, I heard that when the, the founders of Salesforce weren't went to try to get venture funding, uh, 
you know, venture capitalists would say, why, why should we invest in you? You're making an application that runs in a browser, and browsers aren't very fast. Well, eventually browsers got faster. The whole ecosystem of technologies uh, got faster. Java, you know, or JavaScript and, and jQuery and um, broadband became more, applicable, uh, more available. And a similar thing I think is happening with mobile devices. Uh, the hardware is improving. Uh, the tools in the ecosystem of actually deploying these algorithms to phones is improving. We have uh, every few months uh, TensorFlow is releasing some new tool kit or, or sub-library or tool. Same with PyTorch. There are tools for converting neural nets between formats to make them deployable to this type of phone or that type of phone. Uh, different phone manufacturers are uh, like uh, there's now uh, Core ML on iOS. I think Core ML has existed for a while, but they're adding new subroutines specifically for deep learning to make um, common operations like convolutions uh, be more efficiently implemented on that particular hardware architecture. So these. It's kind of what happened with GPUs, honestly, 10 years ago um, with CUDA. So it, when, before CUDA, people had GPUs, but they, there wasn't really an easy way to, to take advantage of them. And then it, there, when, in order for them to become useful, new, new, new sets of tools had to be introduced to make it easier for people to make products that took advantage of that technology. And that is happening right now in this space. Um, that's, Part of the reason why I kind of have a little bit of urgency with this topic because it's a really special time. I really feel this way. I'm almost getting a little bit of goosebumps, and I, I get that way with some things. So I'm a little different in that way. I know, but I do think that we're, especially with 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 AI that can run on our own hardware, maybe wearables or agricultural devices that can farm for us and not have to rely on large tech companies to do all the compute for us in data centers. Um, I think a new, new types of applications are coming about, perhaps also similarly with laptops. When laptops were first coming out, you know, these are, these are things that I don't want to say this, you know, people said that these technologies sucked when they first come out, came out, um, or they were bad, they weren't fast enough, they, the batteries didn't last long enough, um, but things are, uh, improving with time. So I think that's kind of where we are right now with, with this technology. And maybe now would be, I have some demos. I'm wondering when it makes sense for me to kind of go over that. I'll kind of play that by ear. I'm not going to go into it right now. But, um, okay, yeah, so I want to go over uh, the rest of the talk. Um, how am I on time? Okay. Um, yeah, mainly I'm going to focus on algorithms. Also, there's hardware and tools. I've all already talked a little bit about uh, some implications for uh, what it means for what sort of things can be created in the future. Um, and also, there's some. Uh, I have some ideas for maybe where. Uh, well, I I've seen some recent papers that have been coming out. I have some insight into what researchers are uh, try methods and, and approaches that they're taking to improve these algorithms as well, uh, which is very interesting, as we'll get to later. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so, um, sorry, I don't know why there's this third dot, but most, <laughs> the, it's, it's, the history is so brief, and it's still happening that there's a third dot that's not quite done yet, so history is <laughs> in the name, is what that means. Um, so most progress has occurred more, uh, relatively recently, and most of the uh, advances in, in algorithms have been kind of adaptations of, of taking ideas that people have come up for to make larger nets uh, more effective, more accurate, and kind of either just directly downsizing them or kind of trying to understand why they're working so well and, and kind of move them around in a way such that maybe they can make just like a smaller net architecture work, uh, you know, like punch really high and above it, whatever that expression is, they, like do really well. Um, and so in case uh, anyone here is kind of relatively new to deep learning, I just wanted to give like a brief recap of kind of how we got to where we are today. Um, this is kind of funny, I saw this today, I looked on the archives of the New York Times, they have a hyphen here, <laughs> this is 2012. This was back when the first big uh, uh, 
neural net called AlexNet came out. Has anyone here, who here has heard of AlexNet? Okay, yeah, so it's, it's about like 30. So AlexNet was the, it's named after Alex Kuchewski, who was the lead author on uh, the first convolutional neural network that was successfully trained to uh, really uh, do super well on image recognition. And prior to this, uh, ConvNets people had had a really hard time getting them to to, to train. Like you could, you could train them, but they the maybe the network parameters were really unstable, so they wouldn't converge. Or um, there were a variety of things that that weren't working. And and what they did then was there were a few uh, recent uh, improvements prior to that algorithmically. Um, and also, one thing that they tried doing, which worked really well, was using GPUs. So, a big thing, oh yeah, and also, a big aspect was, uh, there was a huge amount of data that became available in 2009, and that actually happened in Miami, at this like super retro looking uh, <laughs> conference. Actually, this is a very important conference, it happened here in Miami, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this data set called ImageNet, uh, when it came out, it was, database of a million images, uh, a thousand images in a thousand categories, um, and it was, uh, it was really important to have this because uh, uh, until recently, um, it's been like, really important to uh, have a lot of data to train neural nets because they have so many parameters, uh, they just need more examples. And so this came out, that really helped a lot with, with research. And that was, uh, that, was, that was unveiled here in Miami, not too far from us. Um, this is when AlexNet came out. This is what the architecture looked like. And basically, um, you take an image, which maybe has like, has like three channels, so red, blue, and green. And you, you learn kind of spatial patterns in <coughs> succession. And that's what these are doing where they're looking at little patches, little local patches of the image. And they, they kind of detect, uh, in, in these early la uh, layers, I don't want to talk too much about this, because I imagine people here are pretty familiar with this, or, or half of you at least. Um, but in, in early layers of a neural net, typically you're, it, it's picking up on things like just normal edges. As you get further layers in, you start inferring things like curvature, or circles, or advanced geometric structure. As you get further on from there, you'll learn things like maybe a face, like as a composition of certain geometric structures and a certain spatial configuration. Um, in a way that maybe if you're looking at a painting of Picasso, it, 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 you, it wouldn't be recognizable because in cubism, as, as, a, as an artistic side note here, you know, it's kind of this, this spatial reconfiguration of fundamental ge geometric shapes. Um, but in, in these, it's, it's learning, oh, certain abstract concepts we can view as compositions of increasingly simple geometric structures. And that's how having these little patches enable, it enables you to kind of learn those, uh, those patterns. And then eventually get into, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. I think we can move on. And then what happened after AlexNet came out is there was a flurry of new big nets and I say big, because they really were big. <laughs> this one, um, it requires, uh, I think, about two gigabytes on a GPU, which for a two-dimensional image uh, classifier is, I think it was the biggest that, uh, that existed, but it, it was also the best. And so anyone who wanted to do deep learning basically had to buy GPUs. There was also this here. I'm going to talk a bit about some later nets this as I alluded to earlier, they were most, with most of the recent work in small neural nets, they've basically mainly been adapting innovations in larger ones. Um, and what's happened since, basically since this one, around 2014, I think, when it came out, um, it's mainly now been about being more clever with the types of structures that are in the neural net architecture. Neural nets are not simple anymore, it's really kind of sad. They used to be very simple in this way, like, oh, just stacked convolutions on top of each other. Now they're like so complicated, or kind of complicated. If you study them for a while, eventually that kind of makes sense. I'm gonna try to go through that. Um, 
So they became more accurate. This is how accurate um, a neural net was able to classify an image in that ImageNet database. So it started out down here with AlexNet, and 55% accuracy was considered amazing. Now, by the way, phones can do about here uh, at a very fast frame rate, which is pretty amazing. Um, GPUs were very important. They got a lot better over time. It was really good for NVIDIA's stock price. I don't know if anyone knows NVIDIA's stock. This is, uh, yeah, as they're kind of getting better here. Um, but also in addition to GPUs, um, as I was saying with AlexNet, some really important algorithmic uh, innovations happened around the same time. So, and I say this because it's I'm trying to kind of move away from, oh, everything's about GPUs, because algorithms are, I think, arguably much more important. Yes, we have the deep learning revolution because of GPUs, but as we know now, we kind of didn't ever need GPUs. If, if research had continued at its same pace, maybe by now, actually, with the smaller neural nets that are doing really well, we could have uh, kind of been achieving the same accuracy by now anyway, or at least on the, for the smaller nets. Um, so I don't know, how, how many here, how many people here have heard of Dropout? And it's like, okay, yeah, cool, yeah, so um, these things were also very important. Um, nets were really big. Uh, this gives you an idea of how big these uh, <laughs> these uh, VGG nets were. It's the, the visual geometry group, uh, they came out with these. Um, and actually now you can kind of see, uh, I, I wish I could, I, I could find an image that only kind of had some of the older nets, but in here you can actually see there are some very small nets that are well, relatively small. These are a little bigger, but if you look at mobile net V2, this came out about eight months ago. This is a tiny net, and it's doing about 72% accuracy on the, on the not top five, but like there, there are different ways of measuring accuracy. This is the strictest way of measuring accuracy, and it's doing better than these behemoths were doing just about uh, less than five years ago. Quick question. Yeah. When you, when you refer to a small net, or uh, are you referring to the number of uh, Number of parameters. Years? The memory that it takes up on a, on a computer, and um, these devices or these uh, these nets. I think AlexNet was about um, uh, like something like 20 million parameters. These other ones, they're like less than two percent of it. They're like 40,000 parameters or 50,000 parameters. So it's the number of parameters. Number of parameters, but that's a good question because there are a variety of ways to quantify this. Um, people quantify it in terms of how many images can you uh, classify per second, like how, how, much, how much time does that actually take to, uh, to classify an image, or how much memory it takes up, how many floating point um, uh, operations there are that are taking place to, to run through a net. Um, I think uh, kind of the, probably the most objective is the um, is the floating point operations or multiply and add, the number of multiply and add operations that occur. I think that's like the only type of operation that happen. And I guess there are also comparisons. Like they have a pooling layer. I guess there's also comparison operations, but um, multiply add is the metric that I've mainly seen in, in literature that's talking about like how big nets are. And that is like quite small now. Is this mainly about like a training on Facial recognition or something like that? Uh, this is on ImageNet. This, uh, yeah, so this is the thousand category data yeah. set. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, and that has things like different dog breeds, right. a boat, right. yeah. Planes. Yeah. Drugs. Um, yeah, so what happened is accuracy density was pretty low. So accuracy density is a way of kind of quantifying. For each additional parameter you add to your model, what's the incremental benefit in terms of accuracy that you get? Like how, how efficient your model is at being good, in a way. And he's like, I'm really like giving these guys a hard time. The VCG like way up here. Um, and then down, down here we have these like little nets, these like mobile net V1, mobile net V2, squeeze net, very uh, uh, 
the recent ones. So yeah, we had higher accuracy, GPUs were required. Um, okay, so this is kind of where we get into what actually has been happening recently in, in the small net space. So when, in, since about 2016, there have been, instead of just nets getting bigger, they've kind of been getting smarter. So in the first area here, I'm actually gonna go to the next slide. Here, oh, how did the text change? Okay, what? <laughs> no, so, so. Um, this one aspect is, is uh, connections between layers. Um, and what these mainly did was they enabled nets to be very deep, because uh, the issue was if you just had a simple neural net that was really deep, it wouldn't converge. It, like, once you got, uh, once you did back propagation through the layers through a net, once you got past a certain number of layers, the gradients were just meaningless. And the gradients weren't stable. So a way of stabilizing gradients is to add more connections between layers. And that's what uh, DenseNet did. Uh, uh, residual connections as well. Residual connections was more efficient. DenseNet was, as you may infer from the name Dense, it literally had a connection to like every layer uh, in the network. Um, but it actually, when it came out, it was the most accurate net that had existed to that time for a little while. And also, there have been these very clever, uh, more complicated layer modules where instead of just having convolutions and max pooling layers being one on top of the other, um, we have these uh, new types of, um, or relatively new, um, ways of um, capturing the kind of abstractions that I was talking about at the beginning um, with what's happening in each individual layer. Um, and this is not totally very well understood why these work so well. Um, but basically, what people do think is they're definitely enabling some sort of dimensionality reduction. And um, I'm not going to go too much into um, some more like mathematical um, like framings of, of this, but it basically enables you to use fewer parameters to capture a very rich kind of uh, parameterization of different ideas that you have about the world at that level of abstraction. Um, also, people did some kind of tweaks with the individual, uh, with, the, with simple operators. Um, called, I'll get into this like depth-wise separable convolution. This is actually a, it kind of, I don't know, this may sound scary to some people, but I swear it's not. It's just a poorly chosen, pretentious name. Um, also, there's been, this is a very interesting area of research, uh, automated architecture search, where basically uh, net design has kind of been gamified, and with all this, these advances that have happened in things like AlphaGo, or AlphaGo, <laughs> yeah, AlphaGo is the really famous one, um, in reinforcement learning, or Atari, uh, using uh, reinforcement learning, and also genetic algorithms, which um, uh, are, are really neat too. They, they've kind of, uh, people have been able to efficiently and automatically test out different net architectures and find what is like the absolute best architecture for, and you can also apply a budget of how many parameters you want. You can say, well, keeping my net not any bigger than this number of parameters, what's the best net I could possibly have? and it'll search a space, and um, I'll touch on that a little later. And there have been other ones too, like these are not the only types of innovations, there have been other things as well, um, but I'm, I don't have all day, so. <laughs> um, residual connections were really clever. So here's this thing here where instead of just having two layers stacked on each other, this is how things were previously with AlexNet or VGG, et cetera. They have every two layers, you actually take the output from one layer and add it as another input to the next uh, set of things, which has this nice way of um, kind of adding a, uh, another, a kind of, a, it, it basically just like stabilizes the data that's flowing through and makes sure that things don't explode or diminish uh, with the gradients. And that worked really well. And then they were able to have uh, like nets that are like hundreds of layers deep. Um, also, uh, for some of the larger uh, ResNet architectures, 
they did these things called a uh, bottleneck uh, res residual blocks, where, as you can see here, if you have, say, like a, a layer that has a, like a, a large number of dimensions, instead of just doing a, some convolutions on that large, dimensional, large dimensional space right away, actually collapse it down to a, a fewer number of dimensions, then do a convolution, and then re-expand it back out, which is a really clever uh, trick. And this little one by one, it's 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 not a, it's called a pointwise convolution, which is a term that I don't like because it's not actually a convolution. It's just taking all of the channels at that individual point and just applying like a, a matrix multiplication, just like a mapping from one number of dimensions to another number of dimensions, like in uh, matrix multiplication with linear algebra. And that works really well. And this is also kind of relevant for um, this like second category of innovations that I mentioned earlier with uh, learning about um, like reducing dimensionality and having um, uh, more interesting, more like doing, doing fewer convolutions and convolutions on uh, attributes, like latent attributes that are like more, more interesting, or like compressing data within your, your neural net. And then we're gonna see this is gonna be used in one really nice architecture that's really small and works quite well. Also there are these, I'm not gonna go into this, it's too complicated, and I need to go faster. Um, oh yeah, an automated architecture search. I, I just love this topic of automated search because it sounds so stupid. It's like, okay, all these genius people, they came up with these architectures. Let's just like train a bot to like find the best architectures. And it works. So they just like, they made, I mean, they, they had to do some very kind of special things. You have to, in order to be able to search, you have to, you have to kind of like parametrize a search space. It's not that easy to do when you consider how kind of categorical and um, it's not like you can just parameterize or how, how should I say this, the, the different variety of neural nets you can have, it's like very, you can't just, I don't know how to say it. They, it, they came up with this way though of searching through a, a small dimensional space that made the exploration problem more attractive, is what I've read. And they used the kind of exploration uh, approaches that they did were mainly, there are some people who've done reinforcement learning, other people have used uh, genetic approaches, and maybe they would train like 100,000 like 100, neural nets and figure out which one was the best. Bayesian optimization is a little different, but that has also been used for things like how do you choose the right learning rate? People use Bayesian optimization to optimize that, for example. That's kind of a related topic. But yeah, so these are, this was kind of the previous state of the art. I think this was about a year ago that all this came out. And then they just like knocked everyone out of the water. And you can also do this here. Um, I think down here they have, oh yeah, multi, multi multiply and add operations. This is what I was getting to, getting at earlier. So if you say restrain yourself to a very small net, they were able to actually find a net that had 74% uh, uh, accuracy with like a very small number of, uh, I don't know what this would be, like 10, or like about a thousand billion, so a, a billion multiply and add operations. Um, so for a giga, giga flop per, uh, for, for going through the, um, or I don't know, I don't know exactly how long it takes, but I think it's probably like 100 milliseconds or something, very fast. Um, so these are a, a, kind of a few of the uh, small neural nets that have come out. Um, I'll talk about this one next. I'm not gonna talk about all these. I'm gonna focus actually just on this one and on this one. And, but there have been some other ones as well, but basically they've taken, borrowed some idea from some big fancy net and kind of transferred it down. And with mobile nets, this was about uh, two years ago, less than two years ago. Um, you can see here that for a very small model, 
compared to say even even this one here um, from a few years ago. They have you know a, a third the number of, of math you have to do. It's still more accurate. Um, down here it's just a very small network. This 0.5 is like a factor that they have for adjusting how big this small net is. Um, if you have a very small network, but actually, so this is about 500 million. This is if you have just uh, 70 million uh, operations, you can actually have a accuracy that is better than what AlexNet did um, with like 50 times as many parameters. It's pretty amazing. And this was not even that recent. This was about 20 months ago. And all they did was they just took a normal convolution, they did these things called the, the depthwise convolutions. They took a normal convolution, which is typically going to take a certain number of input channels, convolve them spatially, and convert that into another number of output channels. Um, and what they did was they first said, let's actually, instead of doing this big convolutional block, um, let's just learn one flat convolution for each individual channel. Do that, and then do one of these simple just dimensionality change, multi matrix multiplication things, the, the pointwise uh, uh, convolution set we talked about earlier. And that turns out to reduce computation by a lot. Like if you have a three by three convolution, which is the most common size oftentimes, that means you're doing a tenth of the computation, which is really nice. And you can basically achieve almost the same accuracy. And so this is kind of going over how, how they're different. So if this is a normal kind of old school convolution, you first do them channel-wise. If they say depth-wise, I like to say channel-wise, because I think just more in terms of like, okay, for each for this channel, I'm gonna do one convolution. It's a very simple, just little matrix patch. And then do that for each channel, and then maybe increase the number of dimensions or or shrink um, after the fact. And this is a way of, in a way, kind of reducing the rank of the convolution that you're doing as well. So it's like introducing this kind of um, regularization to uh, the convolutions that you're applying in each layer. So it has, uh, it's, because it's less complex, um, it's less prone to overfitting probably as well. And another more recent uh, innovation, MobileNet V2, developed by a similar team at Google. Um, they basically also, they, you can kind of tweak how big it is. They basically show that, well, at any kind of variable size or trade-off that you want to make in terms of how big your model is and how accurate it is and how fast it is, that they're the best. So uh, this was the original MobileNet. Um, the second version has a higher accuracy, it has fewer parameters, uh, fewer operations, and it's faster. And this was actually, it's also better than the reinforcement learned um, automated search model, which is kind of interesting. So there's still hope for the rest of us. Our jobs are not automated yet. People, human beings are still developing better neural nets than, than, the, than the robots are for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, this is, so it's kind of, again, this is, this is the same error metric that I was talking about at the beginning or some of the earlier slides. This is 75% accuracy, um, and this was just uh, a little more than a year ago. And there have been, I'm not going to go into some of the other ones, but there have been some even more recently that are even better. And um, so things are getting better and better on these tiny uh, neural nets. So I don't know how much, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but just kind of qualitatively, what is happening is a very similar, um, in a way, kind of a similar thing is with, uh, what, it, what it's enabling you to do is it's, they're, they're doing this here. This is the original residual block, which I think I, I touched on earlier, where it's, um, Say if you had like that, that uh, a layer with 256 dimensions, you can reduce the dimensionality, then do a convolution in that reduced dimensionality space, and then re-expand later. This is they actually took that idea and they turned it around, 
where actually they take a small dimensionality uh, space, they expand it, then they do some very simple convolutions, only depth-wise convolutions. They do this, the stupid kind of convolution, which is more computationally efficient. And then they get those, and then they collapse it again afterward. And turns out, works really well. <laughs> and that's how they uh, were able to uh, beat everyone. Uh, so they, where is that? Oh yeah, so these, these are kind of different sizes, I think, of their, uh, their model, or size of like image, image size, maybe. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the one that the, the robots made, this NASMet, Neural Architecture Search Net, up here, and they're like a little better. So they won. And there are others. Um, I'm not going to go into them. But yeah, this shuffle that thing, that was more recent. Um, and people have basically been, as that kind of slide in the middle that I was talking about, they're either um, using, they're coming up with kind of different uh, <coughs> modules in neural nets that can. Uh, reduced dimensionality in some way, um, or making some of the fundamental operations more computationally efficient. And there are also things um, that people have done with, I think, SqueezeNet. They did something with like slimming a network, like iteratively removing uh, convolutions or something, maybe. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. There's like a lot of literature in this space, so I haven't read all of it yet. Sorry. And, um, oh yeah, another kind of related area is object detection. So maybe I'll kind of like give an example. I'm going to stop actually to give an example. Uh, it's a little demo here. Let's see if I, oh yeah, here we go. Here we go. I'm actually going to live cast my phone um, where I have um, some small nets that are able to run uh, live. Let's see, where is it? Oh yeah, here we go. Oh wait, that's my... <laughs> <laughs> gotta change the input. Can we identify it? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Phone. Does this work? Perfect. Um, so yeah, right here, you can see this is this is actually MobileNet running on my phone. So you can see it, it thinks we're maybe in a library. <laughs> or yeah. It sees a water bottle, it's like, <laughs> or a bake shop, it's maybe 40% sure. I wonder what it thinks this is. Dumbbell, okay, it's actually chapstick. <laughs> but yeah, so this is kind of an example of uh, the kind of accuracy that you, and speed, you kind of see the latency on the bottom there, it's running pretty fast. Um, this was as of about a year and a half ago. Your uh, screen refresh might be hurting it too. Yeah. It might actually be doing it faster. And the I.O. streaming the video to another device, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, that's that one. And then also you can have a uh, object detector, which can identify chairs and people, and can move and see new things, um, or hear, uh, you can see the laptop, the bottle. And this is much slower. It's maybe, you know, one or two frames a second. But like we saw earlier, there's kind of a sliding scale. You can, you can choose trade-offs in terms of how fast and accurate you want things to be. So if anyone wants to see more of this later, you can come how by. Much battery it used, like, Pardon? How much battery it used? That's a great Horrible question. <laughs> um, that's the main thing that's really. Yeah, but. Give me a moment, okay? <laughs> oh, God. Switch this back. 
Are you going to go into how you built the app? Pardon? Can you go into how you built the app, at least on a high level? Did you, oh. was that like a, uh, did you use core ML or what did you, what did you wind up using? Yeah, for this? Um, let me um, kind of go into that a little bit. So it's, um, there's actually a nice tool you can use to, it was you, you who was asking me, right? Yeah, I'll yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, there's this nice uh, utility you can use to, if you've trained a network in say PyTorch or TensorFlow, or cafe, you can convert it to core ML's compiled uh, type, and then package that in a simple app. And it'll, for most, there are a few exceptions that will basically just work out of the box. The main thing where sometimes that doesn't work is if you use a kind of uh, special uh, uh, fundamental operator, um, like maybe a certain type of pooling layer or pooling operator or something that maybe core ML doesn't have an implementation for. Um, but basically, yeah, I just, uh, what I did is I, I, I didn't even train the model. I just found the model someone else had and then I converted it and put it in this Xcode project. I'm not even like a, I, I wish I knew more iOS development because really if you want to like make this in a, app, you kind of have to know how to make apps. <laughs> but for making something simple, like the demo, um, just uses a camera. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. And, and did it, you build this? There's not many features in there with the, with the app, so. Did, did you build these demos just for this meetup? I I mean, them, just for today, or? Yeah, I made it two hours ago. <laughs> 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 um, I made this like two or three weeks ago. That's cool. Yeah. So, Thanks. <laughs> and, and also, there's a lot of code you can copy on the internet. A few other people are doing this. But a fun thing about this area, too, is it's not like 100,000 people on the internet are doing the same thing. It's like a few people, which is kind of promising from a, it's like, okay, I'm not like, you can actually get into this space and be one of the first people working in this space and do something pretty cool. Um, so object detection is like its own separate task. Yes, sir. Uh, are you using Jolo? You uh, for that uh, for that app, are you using Jolo? Jolo, you only look once. Oh, yeah, that was Yolo. Yolo V three. Yeah, I don't know if it's pronounced Jolo or Yolo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I recommend, by the way, if you ever want to see the most hilarious academic article you've ever seen to look up the paper for this. It didn't actually go to a journal, so he like just was like super like humorous throughout the whole thing and ridiculous. But uh, yeah, so YOLO, um, I'm familiar with how the original YOLO works fairly well. It basically reframes the object detection problem as a regression problem and says that um, it, you know, like says, okay, you're gonna have certain boxes of widths and heights and centers and basically just learns to predict values and, and just, just uses normal Euclidean loss to like predict uh, values of, of boxes. The, um, and it doesn't, it, it just goes all through it in, in, one, in one go. It doesn't need any, um, the, these other two-stage object detectors, they start with an initial guess and then they use that initial guess and update the guess with additional information, which actually is more accurate than YOLO, um, but it can be slower. But actually what these people did here, the light head thing, they actually figured out, they took a, take, took a look at what was causing some of these um, multi-stage or two-stage object detectors to be slower than YOLO, because YOLO was the fastest. I figured out how to make the two-stage ones faster, and made this, and that's important because two-stage ones are more accurate than single-shot ones. But most people seem to like, uh, there's more written in blogs and stuff about YOLO, but I wonder if that's because YOLO just has a trendy name. <laughs> I, I think that may be a big part of it. No one really wants to read about Lighthead RCN. <laughs> Doesn't get as many clicks. <laughs> but um, yeah, and um, the nice thing with these as well is that the, the, most of the architecture for object detection 
you can kind of plug and play with different base nets. So if say mobile net v3 comes out, you can take a, a someone can train that net on some other data set, and then you just kind of add on a layer or two or things to kind of make the object detection part work, train those bits on your, your favorite data set, and, and you're ready to go. So it's, um, it's a nice kind of extension of uh, all the other work that's happening in, in a drug mission. Um, so to get to what the troll was asking about, <laughs> batteries. Um, yeah, so the main cons of doing on-device uh, any sort of computation, I guess, really, not just deep learning. Why is there a road on the screen? There we go. Um, is that there are, obviously accuracy is one issue because you're dealing with uh, smaller hardware, um, but also battery life gets drained pretty quickly. For the mobile, for the for the mobile net thing, the first demo that I did of where it's just constantly updating, that actually doesn't take up that much uh, compute. Perhaps also because someone was mentioning maybe some of the frame rate time is being consumed by uh, video capture or um, something that's not necessarily compute uh, related. Um, but the YOLO version that I have here, if I start my battery at 20% and run that app, my phone is dead in like 15 minutes. <laughs> so you do the math, not that I trust that percentage indicator on my iPhone, do the math basically means you can run the app for an hour and 15 minutes, and that's then goodbye battery. But batteries are getting better, so I think people tell me they're getting better, um, and so that's one thing that uh, uh, is a, is a concern. But there are ways around it. Um, but yeah, so also you know, nice thing with running things on device, as we saw in the demo, it's really fast. You get immediate feedback. Um, you can, if you need feedback within 50 milliseconds, you know you can, you know, have a design your net to be even faster, um, or if you need things to be more accurate, but you only need an update every second, you can do that as well. Um, also, from uh, one thing that's nice is uh, you're not paying a dime to run any of these algorithms because you're. It's like bring your own compute. Your customers are computing things for you if you're, if you're a company running this. Um, you can, it doesn't require internet. Um, also, data never, it has, it has, in theory, you can have an app where data never leaves your device, which if your customer is someone who cares about, um, about that, maybe it's an enterprise clock customer who uh, wants to have a really secure application, or a, you know, paranoid consumer who doesn't want, you know, their uh, who really cares about uh, privacy. Not to the little that like being a little cheeky with that, but yeah, I mean, it's um, that's a certainly not a disadvantage. So um, perhaps more um, in, in general, where that can be useful, yeah, like high throughput applications. Say, in, in, in general, I think in situations especially where it's like a mechanical situation, maybe where you need immediate feedback. Um, so things, uh, um, I'm also gonna go to the next slide. Like, say you're driving or biking, and maybe you can have your phone set up that it's looking behind you, and it's maybe like speaking things that it sees or something. Like that could be one application, or if you're biking and so like a maybe you can have this thing on the front of your of your uh, of your bike and it detects potholes or something. Um, and yeah, or if like you could use your phone um, in conjunction with some sort of other mechanical actuator, like a robotics accessory or some other hardware accessory. Um, also, live music generation I could imagine being kind of interesting, like. Something that recognizes um, what you know a melody, or not sort of like recognizing the melody, like oh that's you know this particular song, but something that can recognize the notes that you're singing and like add in percussion or something. Recently, uh, a, a research group somewhere, I forget what it was, Project Magenta. I don't know where who they're a part of. 
they developed a plugin for Ableton that can automatically uh, generate uh, percussion tracks for any song that you're composing in Ableton. And I can imagine some like very simple version of that perhaps being an app where if you're singing something automatically can create percussion and having that low latency is really important there. If you used a, a infrastructure where it's running in the cloud and then having to wait a second to get a response from somewhere else, that wouldn't work very well. Um, and also potentially, um, you know, small autonomous entities uh, Self-driving cars are pretty big, but uh, and, and where maybe a certain level of accuracy, uh, it, it, a very high, uh, it, it requires a very high level of accuracy. But perhaps for certain consumer kind of fun devices, um, whether it's like a remote-controlled car or a drone or something that maybe you can mount a smartphone with it to kind of be the brains for that that device. Like a potential application. And did I mention anything else? Oh yeah, so these are just kind of like applications of, of the pros and cons. So like, well, okay, one con is that it needs battery. So where could it be useful? Where are power sources available? Like in your car, or if you're at work, or if you're asleep, you know, and your phone's charging, or something like that. And I just wanted to wrap up really quick with some kind of uh, uh, ideas of where things could be heading. So in terms of research, um, I'm not a researcher, but if I were a grad student, I would maybe be wondering like, okay, one thing that's interesting about having a small, uh, simple model is that it could be useful in ensemble situations. If you think about gradient boosting with uh, gradient boosted decision trees, the base classifier is a very simple classifier, oftentimes stumps are used in, in gradient boosting. Maybe with uh, neural nets, is it possible to use a very simple base classifier, like a really stupid neural net, but do boosted nets, an ensemble of nets, where each net offsets for errors made by other nets in the ensemble. Or random decision nets as well. Um, maybe you have a type of a net that has a really high variance because uh, like uh, in certain decision tree models, they employ um, you know eat different nodes in the in the trees, only look at certain features. So maybe you could have certain types of neural nets where you know the ran extremely random decision uh, uh, neural nets where each uh, point in um, uh, uh, like the units in say layers of your neural net, you're only considering a, a random subset of features that are coming, or channels that are coming from the previous layer. That could be something that could be interesting. And, and where the individual, the individual members of the ensemble are, are not accurate, but where they together are able to be very accurate. Um, I don't know, people are probably, perhaps people have already concluded that's a bad idea. I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. Um, also, uh, with the using um, architecture research, um, there is some meta learning happening there. Also, uh, who here has heard of few shot learning? Few shot learning. So, with Face ID on your phone, if you think about how how face what Face ID is accomplishing, it's only looking at your face a couple times, and it's able to recognize you thereafter. And it's even able to recognize you in different lighting conditions. If you dye your hair a different color, I think it can. It's also invariant to age um, and how your face may look different at a different age or with makeup. I mean, they have to be invariant to things like makeup as well. It's any sort of thing that would that would vary for the same identity of person, they they're able to see past that. And by just looking at a few examples, and that area, that type of problem is called few shot learning where you're basically able to classify, uh, learn, learn a, a, a good classifier for a uh, specific category just based on a few examples. And this um, only typically works for problems that are very domain specific. So uh, it works for things like faces. Uh, faces are also a very studied uh, area in machine learning. 
So we, we know a lot about, a lot of work has been done in visual recognition. So it's a domain that where we've been accurate. Um, but uh, in terms of small nets, um, yeah, is it possible to potentially train smaller nets um, from some sort of super intelligent, larger net that is running somewhere else? So that is, that's all I have. I actually have an appendix as well, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> So in one of your uh, slides, you had the different optimizations for uh, mobile net V1 versus V2 versus like, no, the whole history, right? Like, um, but you know, with the coming 5G world, like end of this year, next year, in fact, today I just finally noticed on my at and I saw a 5G E, I never seen that before. So maybe it's like good coincidence that happened, but like, so what optimizations are, could be changed uh, with uh, better uh, connectivity to your mobile phone? that previously were optimized for low, maybe low connectivity? Well, actually, I think 5G enables uh, streaming of video to the cloud more easily. Um, in a way, it means that on-device, it, 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 perhaps you know, on-device computation is, is less, there may be some situations where on-device doesn't make as much sense. Um, you would still have to be, uh, the computation would still have to be running somewhere. But one thing I can imagine 5G being useful for, for even on on-device computation, is um, if you're running a neural net on your phone, actually getting updates from a server about how that neural net should be different based on what you're looking at. Transport, down, basically downloading new weights, downloading, a, uh, or maybe you're in a new situation and uh, you want to classify something that you are that you don't have a classifier for, maybe you could like download a new model. And it would be a one-time transfer, um, but with 5G, be able to do that? I don't know. Good question. Uh, a question and a comment on that and then a question. Because we, we have servers and we, we use AI for managing servers. And we went to small AI. How so? What do you mean you use AI to manage servers? They manage the server security, updates, um, add new users. There, there's, we have like eight different small networks that control the servers. One master network that uh, manages them, for lack of a better word. And we have multiple servers. And we went. And the reason I'm here, as a matter of fact, is because we we don't use GPUs at all. I mean we. These are regular, oh, everyday computers. Right? Yeah. So we've optimized, but but we see. You can run stuff like this on CPUs on a normal. They're thing. running on regular CPUs and they're small nets, right? So the interesting thing is we have computers, a grid, computer grid. We have like 13 or 14 all over the world. And we're using the high speed network so that the AIs talk to each other. What do so, they need? They need to do stuff with security and creating users and stuff. Yeah, well, for example, let's say somebody tries to hack a server in, in Sweden. Oh, okay. Well, the, the servers in Miami and Dallas find out about it, and I then they, they get it. Because uh, we read the patterns of what people are doing for hacking, not just what they do, but how they do it, and we establish patterns between them all over the world, right? So, we're, so this small AIs are actually talking to each other, learning from each other. So that if somebody attacks Sweden right. from China, or, pretend, or let's say they're, they're pretending to be from France, but they're really from China. Next time they attack Dallas, even though they're pretending to be from Italy, we still know that it's coming from China. You have to synchronize intelligence, basically. Exactly. So going back to the phone, the 5G will give you the ability for multiple, for multiple AIs to work as one. And, and that, that's something that's actually pretty scary but think about it, you may be running an AI on your phone, but in reality, we may all be running the same AI, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Google or whatever, not part client server. So parts running on the cloud, parts running on the, I mean, that's the future, but that's the capability of what's happening with 5G. That's why 5G is such a big thing, because it gives you basically unli almost unlimited bandwidth or as much as they want to sell you on your phone, and yes, you can do a lot with very little AI, 
with very little CPU power if you're controlled what you're doing with it. You don't try to do everything. Yeah, yeah but, if you were more intelligent with how you use that resource. Yeah. So my question for you was, when you're running the application, do you know how many CPUs, because nowadays all these, you know, two CPUs, four CPUs, how many cores you're actually, is that program running on only one core? I don't know, it's using, well, another, I didn't, I didn't say this during the talk, but one really cool thing about smartphone CPUs, or they're, they're not actually CPUs, the GPU and the CPU is the same chip. Right, so it's running on the GPU on the CPU. Yeah, it's using all the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Core ML is definitely taking advantage of everything that it has at its disposal. And I, disposal. And I think there's what, like 500 cores or something on a, I don't know. It depends I, on the don't phone. Don't quote me on that. It depends on the actual CPU, it depends on yeah. the model. Right. So I was wondering if it was using all of them or just using one of them? Well, judging from how fast my battery died, I think it's using <laughs> quite a few. <laughs> Oh, what, what's your iPhone model? Because like oh, I have a I have a bad one. It's from like three years ago. Okay, the latest iPhone Xs. I think they have like narrow in engine. Yeah. Which is like more for machine learning stuff. Yeah, and I imagine on an iPad, for example, it would be faster as well. Um, yeah, but I, as far as like which what how it's using the hardware, I'm not sure. But Apple. Really, a nice thing with this technology is the, the wind is at our backs. Apple wants to make this work as well as possible on their hardware, because either Google's gonna make something better or they are, they want to use all the compute available um, and provide efficient implementations of, of anything to make these, these nets run as fast as possible on the device, so. What are your thoughts on, like, when we're talking about small nets, we're talking mostly, mostly mobile right now. What are your thoughts on, like, um, other devices, like uh, AR glasses, like Hologen and the uh, Magic Leap glasses, that they were designed with uh, machine learning and um, capturing the, the, the room and having all that technology based on, on that. Is that being applied right now? With Probably, yeah, everything that, um, I said about, say, a smartphone. I, I say a smartphone because it's a clearly understandable example of um, mobile hardware, mm -hmm. basically. Um, though you could, I mean, also, it's basically like non GPU deep learning in a way. So, yeah, I mean, with, uh, with these uh, headsets, I don't know what sort of hardware they're endowed with, what sort of processing power they have. But also, I don't know how battery life works with them, or they have the same battery considerations. Battery. Pardon? They have a separate battery pack attached oh, okay. to Okay. Yeah, because I imagine they're doing a lot of other computation, too. Yeah. So this isn't necessarily a huge additional burden for them. I've gotten to play with the Magic Leap headset, and they have to do a room scan, and it's using machine learning. Uh, and I was wondering if it's a small net or... Probably. I bet it's an object detector like yellow or... Actually, I read about it. They are using NVIDIA Tegra processors for... Technology. Okay, that's the, that's the hardware that they're, or the chip that they're using in the headset? Yeah, NVIDIA Tegra. They, okay. they have, the Magic Leap, you know, right? Yeah. Magic Leap has a small PC, basically, with NVIDIA Tegra-based PC, which you just have connected to your... It's like device. an expandable thing, like, oh, if you want to have a faster processor, you just, like, put in this thing? Yes, it's connected to some kind of processor based on NVIDIA Tegra. Um, yeah. It works out. Great. Yeah. That's that's yeah, that's an area that frankly I don't know much about, but I think there's that's probably a lot already happening there. Because this with object detection, uh, AR it's like a very straightforward, useful application. You sir. So you mentioned that the Deep nets were too large and they got smarter. Is that the trend that's still happening in the industry right now, or oh, yeah. is there where you can see a better improvement? Actually, yeah, I mean, uh, no, people are still making huge nets. I mean, with, uh, who here has heard of GANs? GANs, okay, yeah, so GANs are these amazing, uh, uh, pretty incredible ways of generating examples of images, generating images that look plausible, 
uh, or looked like they could have been taken by a camera in the real world. And in order to do that kind of generation of images, including very high resolution images, you need, you need a really big model, you need to be able to capture um, very fine detail that exists in images. You need to be able to fool humans that a synthetic image was, was real, basically. And that takes a lot of a compute power. So basically, actually, how I should answer that question is for generative modeling, um, big GPUs, or you know, GPUs in general, or lots of compute is required, basically. Unless you, I mean, if you're doing, I guess you could do some sort of generative modeling that is not trying to be very sophisticated. But for things like, like GANs, or I don't know if people still use, yeah, I'm not going to go into the other stuff, but. Yeah. So, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, it's Cedric, Cedric, right? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, the app that you designed, how, have you ever tried to push it any further than you've taken it so so far? I mean, did you do any uh, any experimentation to where you can get a multiple camera set up out of it? Oh, I haven't thought about adding in other uh, cameras, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I think one thing that would be interesting is, I mean, what if you had a drone that had like a bunch of cameras all around, like one of those, what are they called? I don't know, three-dimensional cameras? 360 Cube. Thank you, 360 Cube, right. Um, you know, and do object detection in 360, you know, using your phone's hardware. Yeah, I think something like that would be pretty cool. One of the most amazing things I saw, I was on a bus not too long ago, and a blind person had what looked like an iPhone hanging from a shirt. And the phone said, person in front of you, three feet. Really? Huh. Pull. Sorry, was that loud? Curve. <laughs> yes. And I was going, wow. And I, I talked to a friend. He says, oh, yeah, that's an application. It costs a lot of money, whatever, whatever. Oh, and they do it through the cloud. But I said, from what you, I'll give you a commercial application of, what you, of your app. Uh, that, you know, people who can't see properly or whatever need to walk around, something like that would do the job perfectly well for them, you know, where you don't need, it's not like driving where it needs to this super instantaneous response, but it can do, for, and, and that, I think that app actually said there was a person in front of you or something like that, right. but you could go further, there's a girl in front of you, there's a, you could increase that app so that a blind person can use their phone as their eyes. I mean, the technology is there. It's actually not that far away from that. Yeah, it's it's really, yeah, the, it, it is amazing how many things are already possible. It's just a matter of how, what do you want to make? <laughs> so, yeah. You mentioned kind of at the beginning that you had an idea for a business, but then you didn't mention what it was. Is that a secret, or are you willing to share? Like, <laughs> I have, no, it's not a secret. I have like a Google Doc of like 50 or 60 things. I need to just like do something simple. What I've actually been like thinking of doing was, I've had like a, a bunch of ideas, but ugh. I, I don't like talking about ideas because, not because I'm afraid of anyone taking them, but um, I think a lot of, um, it's not like, I think a lot of the best ideas at first, they sound kind of silly or stupid, but you know, I think also it's just a matter of like exploring, trying something simple out, putting it out there, see how people use it, and then um, kind of refining an idea. But like one, one thing that I've actually, I, I, that I would like to make is something similar to, I guess, what perhaps already exists, maybe I won't make it, but that's something actually that can say, just to using the camera, actually generate sounds that correspond to what it sees. So say like, if you just want to have your, when you're driving, like point your camera in a different direction or something, and it can just constantly be, you can even have it plugged into your car's uh, system. If you can just have like some additional input, of, like through one sense, while you're, you're looking at the, the road in your eyes, what if you could actually get feedback through sound that something that another observer, namely your phone or an app, is doing that can like inform you about your surroundings? Um, and similarly with 
like uh, like when biking or something. I don't know. I, I feel like the, the thing is, I think a lot of situations that we think of, they seem kind of not as useful because we have a bias toward thinking of applications that technology already accomplishes. And there's kind of this like chicken and egg problem about like what is what, what is an application that doesn't exist yet that like we don't think of because technology hasn't been able to achieve it for us before. Um, so watch science fiction movies. Yeah, science fiction. They give, they'll tell you what to do. <laughs> so uh, I'll take one more question. So your oh. algorithm, um, so the algorithm can, can, like, uh, can detect the object in a static way, right? So do you think it's going to be very complicated to add more to compute the dynamic way? That for instance, you can identify a dog, but you also can identify the dog is running away, or can you add layers to it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So I think there, there are two things that come to mind with that. One is object tracking, which I think actually would be pretty doable, because that kind of reminds me. I, I haven't done much reading into how, I'm not super familiar with how object tracking works, but I imagine it's kind of similar to how um, the um, two-stage object detectors work, where they have uh, you know, an initial guess that flows through with additional current information that updates the guess, you know, probably with object tracking. Like, okay, there's this dog. This dog, then a, a new frame of, of uh, the next frame of video comes through. Oh, okay, that, that's still the same dog. I imagine that is doable. But as far as like describing a scene, what comes to mind for that is like uh, scene captioning, which involves like, um, describing qualitatively in words what is happening in a screen, or like in an image, that I think is more complicated, because it involves, um, I imagine it's, a, it's, it's going from an image to a sequence, um, at least just thinking in terms of like the, the particular model that comes to mind for solving that problem. Like you said, could you create something that can describe a situation, like, oh, there's a dog running, um, I don't know if uh, I don't know about efforts or how complicated it would be or doable it would be to compress some of those scene captioning models into a smaller version because they use recurrent nets in addition to the convolutions. Um, have you ever seen some of this work about like automated caption generation for images? It's used by Facebook and Google. Um, like when you look up a restaurant or, or something on Google Maps, they have that little caption like trendy bar with, you know, blah, 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 sensibility or something. That's an automatically generated caption based on images that people have taken to the business. And it's like a certain type of model and everything. And, but I don't know if that's like quite doable on the phone. But uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs>